Welcome to the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center podcast. Yes. My name is Dr. Tanya Neves. I'm the Assistant Dean of Research here at the Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. Today's session is on the intersection of energy security and resilience. With us, we have Dr. Paul Hauser, co-director of the Center for Energy Science and Policy, and he is affiliated with the College of Science, and Dr. J.P. Offred, also a co-director of the Center for Energy Science and Policy with the School of Business. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here with us today. Before we get started further, how about the two of you tell us more about your background? J.P. Uh, uh, th thank you, Tanya. Um, as Tanya mentioned, I'm a professor in the um, School of Business and, and also the, the School of um, Engineering, the Volgian School of Engineering. I have a focus on uh, IT leadership and governance and, and cybersecurity. And, and through that, I'm, I'm partnering with uh, Ambassador Kozlerich and, and Paul Hauser on, on our Energy Center. Wonderful. Paul? So I'm Paul Hauser. I'm a professor in Geography and Geoinformation Sciences in the College of Science. I am principally a hydrologist, so I study water. Water has a huge amount of, of overlap with energy through things like hydropower and energy production. So I've had a lot of experience with the energy sector and I partnered with um, uh, Char and the Business School uh, to help develop the Center for Energy Science and Policy. And uh, we're excited to be here to talk about energy resilience today. Thank you. We have a pretty aggressive agenda this afternoon, so let's just jump right on in. Uh, first up, let's get a brief introduction to the topic. As you know, new technologies leading to distributed energy systems is of uh, critical importance, as well as the re revolutionary change in how to produce, use, and deliver energy to consumers. And finally, the national security implications along the energy supply chain. Uh, do you have any thoughts that you would like to add about this? Sure. So, reliable energy and a reliable energy grid is fundamental to the prosperity of our society. So we rely on um, energy always being there for our hospitals, for our transportation systems, for our homes and businesses. And when it's interrupted, it inter interrupts our lives, it interrupts our economy. So uh, we strive to build resilient power grids and uh, efficient power systems that will allow us to mitigate disasters. However, our power grid largely was designed and implemented 100 years ago, and it doesn't have a lot of the redundancy we need or that we know how to do. It's also changing rapidly. It's changing from a central uh, generation facility, like a coal or a nuclear power plant, to wind and solar. In fact, I just read this morning uh, on CNN that coal is projected to be um, uh, outpaced by renewables uh, in the next year. So um, the traditional uh, baseline load that our um, power grids depend on, which is coal, is uh, going to be um, overtaken by solar and wind. So that has big implications for how our energy grids work. Air solar and wind um, are not constant. They um, come and go. Um, at nighttime you don't get solar. When it's not windy you don't get wind. And we have to have much more flexible power grids that can accommodate those. Further, we have power grid surprises during storms, um, cyber attacks, and, um, and other uh, unforeseen events that can take our power grids down. One good example that we've seen recently is um, in California, mm -hmm. where um, the power grid has intentionally been taken down to prevent forest fires. Correct. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, Governor Ralph Northam of Virginia in terms of his recent initiative and in, in working with Dominion Energy in terms of building a, 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 a wind energy farm on the Outer Banks, not the Outer Banks, but the Eastern Shore, my apologies. <laughs> um, but. He was here uh, a few weeks ago and made that big announcement in, in terms of uh, climate change and economic opportunities for the Commonwealth, but also trying to offer sustainable solutions for the future generations. Right. So the governor um, is taking some uh, really interesting initiatives towards uh, embracing the new energy economy. 
One of them that he announced when he was here at, at George Mason was uh, a goal for the state mm -hmm. to uh, purchase and use renewable energies and uh, increasing that over time. So state facilities, um, you know, like the university and other state offices would increasingly use more um, renewable energy sources. And then the other one is the offshore wind. So mm -hmm. Virginia is taking the lead in the nation on developing offshore wind power, which is uh, great steps forward. Mm -hmm. But they're also relatively small steps forward. So other states, um, California is a great example, have very aggressive goals for the whole state to be um, uh, m more and more reliant on renewables. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm hoping that this is a start of a trend in Virginia where we see more and more aggressive moves towards the new energy economy. More of an incrementalism rather than focusing on uh, punctuating events. Right. Uh, JP? Well, there's also been some changes in the electric system in regard to um, industry structure and, and technology. The industry was um, quite vertically integrated 20 to 30 years ago with generation and transmission and distribution. And many states um, started to introduce um, deregulation similar to what the airlines and the telecommunications companies did. And so as a result, some states now have uh, disaggregated transmission and generation and distribution and also multiple competitors or multiple alternatives within the same uh, region. Uh, so it's added much to the complexity both of, of regulation of, of the power companies but also the, the coordination of the system. Uh, the system pretty much still works to, to, to balance supply and demand and with all of the challenges that that entails. And, 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 and so as you add participants, it increases the, the challenge of that. There's about 3,000 um, electricity type companies in the U.S. now. Uh, many are quite small with limited budgets and in the rural areas, limited IT expertise. Um, and that too adds to some of the, the challenges. From a technology standpoint, that the electric grid is moving from one way uh, transmission or, or electric flow to, to two ways as, as some customers are starting to put electricity back on the grid. That varies, of course, by state, but also connecting to uh, networks with two way communication flows. So it adds to the um, ability to, to manage the network, but also increases the risk due to, due to cyber threats. Uh, some other technologies coming online are, are, are microgrids in, in, in some, some regions. Um, again, setting up a segmentation and the ability to put power back on. The um, advanced metering type services, which are now in their, their second generation in some, some locations, with the, the smart meters in the home, uh, the inverters in the home now for those developing technologies, and those becoming more and more advanced and providing uh, opportunities. Um, thank you. Um, how do you see this connection to other critical infrastructure sectors, such as communications or transportation systems, as related to some of the national security implications? Well, that there, there can be cascading uh, effects um, between the different critical infrastructure sectors. And, and part of the challenge with um, resiliency in, in any industry, but in the electric industry, is, is for some adages or, or some threats, you have quite short warnings, such as a, a cyber attack or a tornado, although they might be quite localized. Others, such as a major hurricane, you might have a, a, a long warning. And then there's differences in the amount of time to come back online and to actually recover. And so the cascading effects happen in cases where there's longer time frames of, of an outage, mm -hmm. uh, for example, with the um, connection between the water system and the electric system. And more and more, too, there's connections between the um, electricity and the natural gas, as we now have about 30% of our generation is natural gas. One of the interesting things, and in, um, I was in Miami for Hurricane Wilma several years ago, and is the, the delays. And so the, the, the power went out to much of Miami. And then it was about eight to ten hours later that the phone systems went out because there's power mm -hmm. within the pole, with, associated with the poles. And then at the time, uh, Florida didn't have a, a law requiring uh, gas stations to have a pumping system of generators. Mm -hmm. So after several days, that the, the, the gas stations weren't able to provide fuel either. And so mm -hmm. it was a, a cascading a, a effect that created a lot of the challenges. So Wilma was much smaller than um, Sandy, for example, but still you were able to see them quite quite visibly. Well, I mean, I experienced 
the remnants of a hurricane in Virginia Beach a few years ago, and it knocked out the power system. But a lot of the water systems in the major hotels were connected to the power, so you lost electricity and you also lost running water. So it can be cascading indeed. In um, Northern Virginia and the D.C. region were particularly vulnerable, uniquely vulnerable compared to other areas because uh, of the, the central hub of government is here in D.C. And Northern Virginia has a, a lot, shares a lot of those with many of the government facilities just outside of the D.C. region. In, in, a, in addition, we have um, an IT corridor um, uh, out toward, towards Dulles and Ruston mm -hmm. where we uh, move a large majority of the data that, um, that you know, for commerce and, yeah. and um, information flow across the country come, or even around the world, comes through this corridor. Mm -hmm. So power losses in this region have some unique vulnerabilities in terms of national security and also just security of the economy. Mm -hmm. um, many of these facilities have backup generators, but as JP noted, those generators only have so much capacity. They may only last a few days with the diesel right. they have, and they're kind of designed for the power grid to come back up at some point. If we have a cyber attack or a attack on you know major power lines or facilities, it could be much longer before we get those back. Those are the kinds of of resilience issues that mm -hmm. uh, we we're worrying about in our center. And you know the implications aren't only for the United States. Earlier this year at the National Council on the Science and the Environment's annual meeting, one presentation indicated that more than 70% of the world's internet traffic flows through Northern Virginia. So not only bringing to bear the, the implications for our security here in the homeland, but also the disruptions of an international economy, not just ours. So thank you, gentlemen. Um, moving into the second part of our agenda is uh, focusing on this case study that the two of you have been working on with the University of Connecticut and what that experience has been like. Um, I see that the University of Connecticut Center established was established to prepare for consequences of natural disasters like tropical storms and then also as you mentioned the DC area presents a, a regional challenge, a, regional challenges, additional challenges um, and then also with the movement with Amazon's HQ2 into the area what other uh, challenges do you, the two of you foresee with this? So let me talk about the Yukon Eversource Energy Center first. Okay. So the University of Connecticut has um, developed over the last 10 years a center to help the, the energy um, providers in Connecticut with um, kind of expert systems to help them be more resilient. So those are in the areas of predictive damage modeling uh, to help them prepare and also to do emergency response. It's in vegetation management, so the trees, um, to assess uh, multiple grid hazards. Um, the third area is vo in vulnerability assessments and to support grid hardening. Um, the fourth area is grid modernization, including smart integration of renewables and storage. Uh, fifth is a very important grid, cyber and physical security. And finally, um, enhancement of um, sustainability through educational opportunities. That's where a university really can shine strongly to have education to help uh, professionals learn how to produce more resilient uh, grids. So the Energy Source Center at UConn started out with um, just a, a pretty basic understanding of trees can fall on power lines and um, cause outages. So they said, can we predict this? Is this something that we can um, uh, maybe even send crews uh, out before a storm and have them ready to fix things? Um, so they did this. They have storm models. They can predict where the wind or the rain, ice, snow, Maybe more severe, mm -hmm. and they, and also where it interacts with vegetation that might be threatening to power lines. They can send these uh, crews out before the storm, and they've gotten good enough that the power company relies on their predictions to do these um, pre-positioning before a storm. They can also go beyond that and say, "Hey, we've got a problem in this area. The trees have grown too high. 
and we should really um, do some mitigation. So some grid hardening, move the power lines or, or remove some of the vegetation to reduce the threat to the, um, to the, the grid. Um, Virginia is uh, the fifth highest in the nation in terms of damage from storms and power outages. Um, Connecticut is like 34th or something. It's, it's quite a bit lower. So they are um, ahead of the game in producing this, but we have an even more compelling reason to right. go after this. Um, if you've been following the news about California, California has a grid vegetation problem. Mm -hmm. um, so severe that last year, the power company, um, uh, PG&E, actually was blamed for um, a devastating wildfire. So um, wind and dry conditions caused the power lines to spark a fire in, right. in the trees. And um, people died, and people's homes were lost. It was quite tragic. So to avoid um, the liability of future uh, issues with the power grid, they've decided to just turn it off. Right, which so, is a completely different controversy that they're experiencing in California now. That's right. So during times when it's dry and windy, they're like, sorry, we can't take the risk. We're turning off the grid. And so then you have people and houses and hospitals without power for sometimes days or even a week at a time, and that causes a whole set of other issues. Right, so it's replacing one vulnerability with a set of others. Right. Or making populations that wouldn't traditionally be vulnerable now be vulnerable. So Virginia doesn't have the severity of issues that California has on droughts, but we do have droughts. We just experienced a flash drought towards the end of the summer, and uh, we could run into these kinds of issues with forest fires sparked with, um, with power line interactions. Um, and we could use some of the techniques that UConn has developed to help us harden our power grids. JP? Um, part of the um, challenge from a public policy perspective is, is how to assess risk and allo allocate resources. And then with the change in industry structure with more and more competitors, how to actually fund in investments and in, in risk avoidance. Right. And, and for the uh, electric grid in, in, in here in Virginia, um, projects such as uh, University of Connecticut could have a, mm -hmm. a, a big impact in regard to trees and tree risk, especially for the s types of storms or the types of outages that have a long lead time. Uh, there's other ways that that could help too. There's uh, approaches you can take with the distribution system to, to change the architecture so it's more networked instead of radial which mm -hmm. can have a big impact too, especially in areas with what, quite a few trees. You can do a, a segmentation as, as telecommunication networks mm -hmm. do. You can in increase the uh, communications capacity through fiber optics. So there's this question as to how do you allocate resources, uh, how much do you really need, um, and what risk are you trying to avoid, and how to communicate with the public or, or develop a consensus uh, on how to address um, low risk but or relatively low risk but high consequence types type outages. You're absolutely right. I also believe that the University of Connecticut is working with a, another university uh, via Oak Ridge National Laboratory utilizing their land scan in order to take satellite imagery to map the world's population along the coastline in order to determine with more accuracy uh, what that base is and what the impact of uh, natural disasters such as a typhoon or a hurricane or earthquake might be and what kind of impact on grids and those areas m might have. Um, just because they don't keep up with the same uh, census counts as we do here in the United States or they may not really know what their vulnerable populations are because in a lot of places they're all vulnerable, correct? So it's really fascinating to hear about the University of Connecticut and, and the various activities that they're involved in and that not only here at George Mason that we can work on trying to uh, advance the Commonwealth, you know, the common good for the Commonwealth, but also scale that up so that other communities throughout the United States could also use that as, as an as a operable model. So the, the UConn, I want to mention our partnership with UConn. So we've um, actually had shared faculty and students who um, have you know brought this to our attention that we should partner with them. We've had um, visits by their faculty to uh, discuss opportunities for collaboration. And while UConn has a, a great um, center that they put together for energy resilience, um, GMU has 
unique resources that we can bring to the table to enhance that partnership. So one of them is one that J JP just mentioned in the policy and governmental areas and mm -hmm. business. Um, certainly with engineering and cyber, we have a lot to bring to the table. Mm -hmm. And we have a pretty unique area. Um, UConn has, um, you know, Connecticut is, of course, uh, uh, they get more affected by winter storms and things, but we have this tremendous hub of uh, data centers and government that um, we're going to learn a lot that we can actually share back with uh, UConn and enhance each other's efforts. You're absolutely right, especially with the new establishment of the Center for Resilient and Sustainable Communities and also the University's Institute for Sustainable Earth. So not only is Virginia, but also Mason taken an initiative in all matters around sustainability and resiliency, and energy is just one of those. Um, moving on, implications for energy resilience. Uh, you know, it requires this sense of community engagement, and it's something that I often say uh, is the three C's model that I've been working on. Um, as we know, FEMA and, and other entities within emergency management or community resiliency always focus on communication, 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 coordination, coordination, coordination. And that is wonderful. But there's a third C that I've often found missing, and that's collaboration. So without that increased communication, you will never enhance your coordination and an effort to, to, to build up this meaningful collaboration. And that's where we really get at this, this policy and social piece. You've got to build up that social capital, not only with your community and, and key stakeholders, but also you've got to build up your political trust with your decision makers. And so when we talk about strategies that are customer-based and require balancing interests, not only for national security users or individual users or private sector I users, are we missing a piece of this conversation as related to energy resiliency? Well, I, I think the, um, a, a, as with uh, other industries or other circumstances, um, gaining a collaboration or, or participation on, on something where there's a, a common good, but perhaps not a, an individual benefit or, or a mm -hmm. company benefit can, can be a, a, a great, great challenge. I think there's mm -hmm. Um, other industries with a similar challenge. I think for a while here in the U.S., the uh, electronic medical records was something similar. There was a great public good, but but not necessarily um, an industry or a group of industries or individuals that would that would benefit enough to, to, to fund it. Right. And so, with the increasing complexity of the electric industry, with the, the number of participants and the number of re regulators, there's not one point of control or, or one oversight organization and as a result of that that the collaboration and the mm -hmm. uh, community part are, are, are integral to, to how we do for resiliency. Mm -hmm. Collaboration is key to this so the university has been very keen on developing transdisciplinary opportunities for collaboration. What does that mean? It means that we are bringing together uh, disciplines that are really traditionally very separate and working on the intersections between them. And that brings great opportunity for advancement when you r work at the fringes of different communities. And when you bring many of those communities together, many of those different disciplines, you have an opportunity to really do revolutionary things. So the university is actively trying to encourage faculty and students to work across those um, traditional lines. Additionally, for the ideas we're having, discussing here for energy resilience, we have um, a great challenge of bringing regulators in the state and the, and the federal government together with academics and um, practitioners, people who are actually running power companies and putting in power lines. It creates a lot of potential tensions about some people wanting um, uh, to worry about profits, some people right. wanting to worry about education and research, and other people worrying about, um, you know, planning for the future. And those um, can't, those aren't always um, uh, easy to mitigate or to, to go across those different cultures. But that's our challenge here, is we really need to, to right. do that to make sure our future energy resilience is strong. It's not just that desire, but that need to connect scholarship and research with communities of practice in order to have, like we were saying, the three C's, but to really have an impact and, and, and a measurable and meaningful outcome. So, um, 
Another question is the prime objective in, of increased resilience to enable communities to recover from a natural or man-made disaster. Uh, what is the role of cyber and smart cities in this? There's a, a, a positive role and there can be a, a negative role too. Um, so with smart cities, that there is more and more of a reliance uh, on um, internet and, and, and computers and, and electricity um, for the operation and, and management of, of the city and for the residents and citizens' well-being. At the same time, if there's an outage or if there's a uh, large-scale cyber attack that, that causes an outage for a number of, of weeks, there, there's also a, a, a risk for society functioning. I think that's part of the issue, at least for, for some cities who, who are opting not to go down the route of a cashless society. Uh, partially it's access and, and, and um, for all citizens that to, to, to the economy, but I think too there's, there's the risks of the cashless society in, in cases if there's an electric or, or, or internet outage. Um, another aspect of, of, of the smart city, which I think is a, uh, both a plus with all the information that's available and, and, and the types of services that can be provided or the insights gained, which are tremendously helpful in the case of resilience, is the, the downside risk of, of, of privacy. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's some wonderful examples of, of, of privacy initiatives of, of look, city governments putting the information into a uh, commons um, and having quite tight controls in regard to not having it, not allowing it to be sold off. But there's other examples on the other side where, where local governments have a, a challenge from a contracting standpoint right. and may well sign a contract that they're not aware of where the data is going. Right. Uh, speaking of uh, circumstances of, you know, having a small energy outage, whether due to an natural or a man-made disaster. I'm not sure if the two of you are aware of this, but during Hurricane Katrina, the University of New Orleans got put on lockdown as the evacuation orders were mandated. And um, at my former university, we kind of did an open call for uh, professors and other scientists to come have a home while, you know, the city is being, it's in recovery. Um, we, at the time, hosted the as associate provost of UNO, uh, Dr. Dennis McSeveny, and he got a phone call by the president and provost essentially saying that the server with all the academic credentialing of all the students, both prior and current, was on the sixth floor, fifth or sixth floor of the main administrative building with no backup anywhere. So, you know, when you talk about energy going down, and not just energy and the destruction of potential hardware, but then also if wind and and other types of elements of these disasters, say say water, have an impact. Uh, you know, it's like you said earlier in the beginning, it's got a cascading implication. And so, you know, that all originated with something being impacted by the energy system being down. So you really, you know, it doesn't matter if it's a rural community, if it's an academic community, if it's an urban city, you know, everyone's vulnerable at one point or another. So. Uh, personal experience I've had is I, I really like to adopt new technology and I have a lot of smart technology in my house so little outlets that can turn on and off things like a timer but now they're all Wi-Fi um, smart thermostats um, things like that and so uh, I don't know, a year or so ago I set up um, lights in the front of my house to come on at a certain time and go off at a certain time and um, pretty simple but since then I got a new cell phone the apps changed and um, I needed to reprogram it. Um, <laughs> I needed to have the lights turn on at a different time, and I could not figure out how to do it. Um, I had lost, I didn't even know what the app was called. So sometimes these automated systems can lead us to complacency. But even worse, um, they can be hacked. I mean, somebody could mm -hmm. change my, my, my thermostat while I'm out of town or something if it got, got hacked. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then, you know, my house could, the pipes could freeze or things like that. So there could be, uh, that's a very small example of, right. of issues, but those can be implemented at very large scales where you could have um, everyone's thermostats uh, changed or stoplights uh, you know, put out of, out of operation mm -hmm. by a hacker. So, um, and on and on, you could have uh, issues with hospitals and, and power mm -hmm. grids and bridges. And it's, it's scary if you think about what can happen in a large scale cyber attack on the power grid. Um, another interesting thing that I've noted is um, our 
I think that our resilience to power outages has actually decreased over time. So I do a lot of work in Africa, and um, the power grid goes off all the time. Yes. So I'm uh, given in the middle of a presentation, and um, the lights go off, and the projector goes off. Um, and nobody flinches. They just stay there, and they said, oh, just, just talk on your slides. We don't need to see them. Um, and people who are used to this don't even hesitate. They just keep on going. Um, they keep ta talking. When the power comes back up, then they their presentation flips back on. Yeah. We had a power outage on the GMU Fairfax campus um, about six months ago, and they um, evacuated the campus. They canceled all the, the meetings, all the classes. <laughs> um, uh, as far as I can tell, we have very little tolerance to a power outage. It becomes a safety issue, mm -hmm. and um, we just don't have the capacity to deal with it. And so we cancel everything. That's right. Uh, just this morning, I was on my way in, and there was an announcement of a school closing because they lost power. Um, in other parts of the world, they don't even have just power, or it's part a normal of thing. Life. Right. So uh, it kind of is concerning to me that we uh, we seem to our tolerance to uh, power fluctuations has really decreased. Well, as far as the vulnerability to the power system main, being maintained, you're saying that that is increased other than, you know, when we have these extreme weather events and or cyber attacks. So in your professional scientific area, do you feel that urban areas are mostly vulnerable or are we seeing middle America or, or other rural communities also becoming just as vulnerable to these types of uh, um, uh, cyber attacks? and also uh, the failure of an energy grid? Generally, I think we are becoming more vulnerable. I'm not sure about the urban versus uh, uh, rural areas being more vulnerable, but certainly, um, take for example, this room has no windows. So if lights go off, we're gonna be in the dark. So um, those kinds of issues are more prevalent in, in urban areas. Majority of um, local governments in the country um, have, have Quite small populations, mm -hmm. uh, 50,000 and, and or lower, and but many of those also own and operate uh, critical infrastructure, so water systems, uh, traffic. Uh, some have electric companies. Mm -hmm. um, some have airports, and, and so in many of the citizens in those uh, local jurisdictions, jurisdictions, just as in larger ones, have an interest in smart city type services and digital services. Right. And so that there, there is a risk for the, the smaller governments and the smaller locations too. And it, recently, uh, more and more of those are ones that you see um, with ransomware attacks yeah. and, and in the news, uh, partially because they don't have the cybersecurity budgets or, or the expertise mm -hmm. necessarily, uh, but also too that they may not have done the uh, planning and have the, the backups that, that, that some of the larger jurisdictions have, although some of the larger ones have had great problems too. No, you're absolutely r right. Uh, even in the world of emergency management in terms of the expertise at the local level and some of our more, more rural areas throughout the country just haven't had the training or don't have the technical expertise to, to really uh, deal with some of these disasters that we're starting to see become more onslaught. And that might be natural, as we've talked about, man-made, or even moving into the high threat world, which is separate from cybersecurity and terrorism, but more of your active shooters, riot violence. And so the, the capabilities are just more often than not limited. So thank you. Um, finally, I would like to, to ask, how do we engage national security users in this process in terms of enhancing uh, energy resiliency? as uh, one of the critical infrastructure sectors? And then also, what is the role of power companies and also distribu distribution enablers? So I'll address the second one. Power companies and uh, uh, distribution, um, power distribution grid operators have uh, probably a central role in enhancing resiliency. So by potentially collaborating with academics and researchers. They can be early adopters on new techniques for smart grids, for grid resiliency improvements and hardening like we talked about before mm -hmm. with uh, vegetation mitigation, right. predictions of um, storm related damage, um, developing resiliency to cyber attacks, and even um, the issues with 
um, over automation where nobody knows how it works anymore. Um, that could be an issue where they can uh, engage in innovative technologies and sometimes they're resistant to that. They mm -hmm. are often more traditional and um, uh, much more interested in making a profit than, um, than doing long-term planning. So we have to engage them on how this long-term planning and resilience can be good for the bottom line. You're absolutely right, and, and hopefully the connection of training students that might go on to work for some of these utility companies, particularly in the energy sector, might, might enhance or, or move along that relationship building more quickly than it would otherwise. At least that's what I've experienced in, in my field. Uh, JP, what do, you, what do you think? There's a modeling and simulation aspect um, to understand better what the, the risks are at the the regional level as, net, well, as, long, as well as the national level and the, the possibility of cascading effects. And then with the, the better understanding of, of risk and a, a greater consensus on, on what the risk is, there be greater possibility or, or benefit, I think, from all of the, the collaboration work that, that's going on currently between the, the national government and the Department of Homeland Security and the state and local governments and the private sector companies. No, you're absolutely right. Gentlemen, do you have any final thoughts before we wrap up our, our session this afternoon? It's been great to have this discussion and I'm looking forward to making progress on energy resilience and uh, having Mason engage more in transdisciplinary energy resilience research. Thank yes, you. I'd like to second that. Wonderful. And, and thank you, Tanya. Well, I really appreciate the two of you coming in and, and working with us on the Homeland Defense Analysis and Information Center podcast uh, around critical infrastructure protection. Again, energy security resilience is a critical element in, our, in protecting our homeland, not only in terms of cybersecurity attacks, but also when we talk about natural and man-made disasters, and that's an area that is still relatively young as both a discipline and also a community of practice. So, so thank you.